Germany is Andrew Brown. Uh, she was also known as the Hubble, and she is a freelancer and the release manager of Twisted Project. She is also a very uh, frequent speaker in many conferences, many Python and Django related uh, conferences, so giving, giving keynoting or speaking. Uh, she is also known as uh, her contribution to modernize the, uh, the, the Twisted project. So today she is going to talk about Django and Twisted. So let's give her a big applause. Hello, Hello everyone. Uh, just wait for the slides to pull up. So, so, cool. So, so today, today I'm going to be talking about making scale Django be twisted. So, as mentioned, I am Amber Brown, better known as Hawkal on random bits of the internet. Here's my Twitter account if you want to follow me and tweet at me. I am from uh, Perth, Western Australia, so pretty much directly south of here, uh, just down about 3,000 kilometers. So um, it's pretty cool, and I've come a long way, so it's uh, pretty cool to be here. So uh, I am the uh, core developer, a release manager, and a major Python 3 porter for the Twister project. So the Twister project is an asynchronous framework. It's been around since 2001, at least. And it works in Python 2 and Python 3 and lets you do sort of asynchronous networking uh, in your applications. My day job is at Crossbar I.O. Um, I do binary release management there. And I ported uh, Audubon and Crossbar I.O. to Python 3. I'm also in charge of doing the web API and uh, REST integration in uh, Crossbar. So I would like to talk about scaling Django applications. So at its core, Django serves one request at a time. One request comes in, it processes it, it sends a response. That's all it does. To actually serve multiple requests, sort of on your server farm at multiple times, um, you can run it in a thread or in a process. So you're actually still running one at a time. You're just running that one at a time times many. You can figure out how many requests you can actually handle by getting how many processes times the thread pool size. So if you have four processes, for example, you've got four cores, and then you have four threads per core, it'd be 16 concurrent requests. So here's an example of, for example, Gunicorn. So you have Nginx up the front that accepts the web requests. You have Gunicorn, which has two workers in their own processes. And then each one of those workers has four threads. So using this, you can handle about eight concurrent requests. Historically, if you need to handle more requests, for example, you need to handle tens or hundreds a second, you would just add more web servers. So here's an example of how that ends up looking like. You have a, a server up the front, which runs something like HAProxy or uh, Squid or something that reverse proxies to your two servers. <coughs> so this does some form of load balancing. So you end up with server two and server three having the request shared between them. And in that case, it's just two more identical versions of the servers. So each one has their own threads, and one of those has their own threads. So you're still limited to those however many concurrent connections per server, but you've added more servers, so you can handle more. Now, the downside to this is that if you start off with one server, and then you need to add another. You've added a new piece to your infrastructure. Now, this requires more work. Um, you might, uh, it might not work with what you're doing. It's just extra headache on top. So you end up having to modify what you've got and change it, and that could always cause problems. And that means that scaling higher ends up with more complexity because you have 
uh, several layers of, of proxying in front. Then you have your servers, which are all supposed to be set up identically, but you've got many, many more of them. Each of them with, uh, say, Nginx, Gunicorn, Python, Django, all of those things that have to be kept in sync for all of those servers. And that's a quite a heavyweight stack to have on each server. But is there a better way to handle lots and lots of requests? Well, let's look at the problem domain. Modern web applications have two things that take a long time to do in serving a request. First is CPU bound work. So that's things like large amounts of math, natural language processing, um, sort of big data processing. When you're doing a lot of uh, stuff that takes a lot of time to run, and uses up a lot of CPU. So this is most tasks you think about when you need to process a lot of data. Now, unfortunately, on most Python interpreters, um, you can't really use Python threads to distribute the work. Um, you end up running into something be called the global interpreter lock. Now, the global interpreter lock says that only one thread of n Python threads may run Python code at one time. Now, fortunately, you can run n uh, threads that are actually running C code because they release the global interpreter lock. But since we're writing Python, we want to be able to run Python in a lot of threads, or in C code, you're in Python. The other uh, thing that takes a long time is I.O. bound work. This is things like database requests, or web requests, or network I.O. So, for example, if you are talking to another web server to download a web page, or you're talking to a database to fetch some records, or you're ta talking to um, some form of network device to get some information. Now, this can take a while, because who knows how long it's going to take. Because when you've got uh, things like uh, external web proxies, they might take 300, 400, 500, multiple seconds. You, you never really know until it happens. So threads work better for this, because the actual networking is in C code. So the global interpreter lock is released. But thread switching overhead is quite expensive in Python, because you have to lock the jill, uh, switch to that thread, do some work, release the jill, go to another thread. It's, it's just a lot of work on top of what you're already doing. And even though this is all done in the background for you, it does lead to uh, quite a lot of time. For example, uh, using the thread pool with Twisted, we have noticed that sometimes it can take 43 nanoseconds to switch between threads which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you've got a lot and a lot, a lot of thread switching going on, which does happen a lot, you'll switch a couple hundred or thousand times a second, that most of the time you'll be spending is getting locks, releasing locks, and switching threads. Now, we can solve these issues, but let's focus first on I.O. bound applications. So I'd like to talk here about something called asynchronous I.O., and event-driven programming. So event-driven pro event programming is when your code is triggered on events. Now, these events can be many things. Mostly, they are incoming data on a network, or some computation has finished, or a subprocess has ended. Basically, anything that happens can become event an event. How do we tell when these events have occurred? Well, every, it's, it's generally pretty easy because everything really starts from input and output. So all we need to do is have asynchronous input and output, which is event data, and then the events that are made up from the incoming uh, so inputs are therefore event driven. So it all works in, in the same system because a web request coming in that is saying, get HTTP 1.1, blah, blah, blah. Now, that starts off as network, uh, as network IO. So, it's come in, it added to the HTTP parser. HTTP parser, web parser passes the information and goes to that, hey, there's a web request. So, and it turns that into an event. 
So everything starts from the I.O. To help you, there are event driven programming frameworks. So one example is Twisted, which is the project I work on. It's uh, rather old. It's uh, this is known SVN history, so it's very, very old. Um, but very, very mature and quite widely used. AsyncIO in Python 3.4 was introduced much, much later, um, coming around in about 2012. However, AsyncIO does have Twisted as one of its uh, core inspirations. And one of the things at its core that it, they both use are called selector functions. So selector functions are named after select, and poll, and epoll, and kq. Now, these selector functions, all they do is they take a list of file descriptors. So for example, that's a network socket or an open file. And it will tell you when something is ready to happen to them. They can handle thousands and thousands of open sockets and events. It's no problem to them uh, because it only returns some information when something is ready. So if something isn't ready, it just keeps waiting. <coughs> so once you get the data, it is channeled through a transport, so for example, a TCP transport, to a protocol. <coughs> now, HTTP and IMAP and SSH, all of these are protocols. They implement some form of taking raw data from the network and processing it into useful events. Now, in these event-driven frameworks, sending data is queued because you can't send 100 megabytes of data down a pipe at once. You need to queue it, and you need to wait until the network has finished sending the first amount of data before it'll send the second set of data, and so on and so forth. Now, this blocks. So if it can't send the data, it will try again later. And if it can't do it now, it will pass control to the next event to be processed. So that ends up meaning that you have a lot of cooperative multitasking. And cooperative multitasking means that you don't have to have threads because everything is working together. No threads is good because that means that you don't have switching overhead. But no switching overhead means that your code is faster. And also, it means that you have a higher density per core because if you have four cores, you just run four of these sort of setups, and then they will use your cores as efficiently as they can. The thing that uh, uses the selector functions is generally called IO loops or reactors. This is because they sort of react to incoming and outgoing output, uh, incoming and outgoing input and output by creating and running events. As I said, there is higher density per core. You don't need threads. But you still end up with concurrency and not parallelism. Because at the core, you're still running on Python, and you can't run more than one Python in a thread. So even if you do have things on a thread pool that cooperate with your reactor, you still won't get parallelism. The best case for this sort of application is when you have a high I.O. throughput. So for example, you're sending a lot of data on the wire, like tens or hundreds of megabytes a second. When you have high length clients, for example, uh, over the internet, where it might take 400 or 500 milliseconds for the other side to respond, you don't need to block while you're waiting for that. You can just process other things in the meantime. And especially when you're not doing a lot of CPU processing, if you're just talking to the network, then you're not doing a lot of CPU time, which means that you can do a lot of networking really, really fast. But sometimes we might want to process CPU bound tasks. So how do we do that? We might want to run that because we do more than just network. We might need to run some math or process new image or all of that stuff. So how do we do that? What we use is event-driven pro event programming, and we use something called work queues. The CPU-bound tasks are sort of serialized and added to a queue rather than being run directly. So how this ends up looking like is this. 
So you have your web server. It adds items to your task queue. And then the task queue is read by workers. <coughs> so in this instance, where we've serialized the data we want and put it on the task queue, we have now transformed this CPU-bound task into an I.O.-bound task for the web server because the web server itself does not need to care about actually doing the work. All it needs to do is wait for a response that the work has been done, pick that up, off the queue again, and then send the data back. We have also made the scaling characteristics of this rather horizontal, because if the task queue can handle it, all we need is more workers. So, as you can see there, we have, for example, two servers. They're not identical. One has two CPUs and one has four. But it doesn't matter because they all work off the same task. Now, adding and removing tasks on the queue is very, very cheap. Now, things like Redis and um, other sort of uh, task queues are very, very good at this because they've been very highly optimized and used for years and years and years to process billions of requests. So you'll generally end up with something that performs pretty well and will uh, take as much advantage of the server that you use for the, host queue, uh, for the task queue as best it can. So these task queues scale rather well because they're generally optimized in uh, C or other high performance languages. And you don't really have to care about how they scale because a lot of them just have options. It's like, OK. You want to shard? Well, you can shard with this and this and this. It's something that you don't have to care about, and it's something that you don't have to solve, which makes it a lot better when you're deploying this sort of solution. So if you want to do more work per second, you just add more workers. Because, well, OK. Because everything scales horizontally, you can just add more workers behind it, and everything will just work. Because the task queue itself does very little work, and the web server itself does very little work. So those aren't going to be the bottlenecks. So if this is all good, do we have an implementation of a sort of system that we can just deploy? Well, we do. It's called Django Channels. It is a project to make an asynchronous Django, so a Django that can process more than one request a second, or more than one request at a time, rather. It's authored by Andrew Goblin, who uh, brought us south, and 1.7's migrations. So he's really, really good at you know, making Django do really cool things. So this is generally what it starts looking like. So the interface server accepts incoming requests. The channel queue is the task queue, and then you have workers. So it's all rather conceptually similar. The interface server only has to care about serving HTTP requests and WebSocket requests. The channel queue just stores it, and then the workers do the actual hard work. So yeah, it, all it does is accept requests, nothing else. Workers can just take them off the queue. Um, they tr uh, channels tries to be first in, first out, as best it can, and be ordered. So all the workers need to do is ask the task queue, what do I have to work on next? And then we'll take it and do it. Results from these workers are then added back to the, ch back to the channel, and then the interface server picks them up. So and then it just writes out the HTTP, HTTP request. So itself, again, hasn't done any work. Everything is done by the workers and the channel. So the interface server is pretty much only I.O. bound, and it does no work. So all we need to worry about is putting lots and lots of bytes down the network very quickly, which is perfect for asynchronous I.O. It's basically what it's made for. You're doing a lot of network, and you are doing network between clients and the task queue. Daphne, which is the reference interface ser server, um, is actually written in Twisted. So it uses, 
So it uses uh, Twisted to provide the asynchronous networking, and then it uh, uses Autobahn uh, Python to do the WebSockets. It is capable of handing thousands and thousands of requests on mon modest hardware, so you don't have to have the biggest or most powerful interface server. And you might only need one for handling lots and lots of requests. The channel layer itself can also be sharded. So that means that you end up with things like this, where if it's too much for the channel queue to handle, all you need to do is shard it. So sharding means that they work together, but servers that host workers can talk to each and stop and and prevent overwhelming the task queue. Now, this also works with interface servers. You can have multiple interface servers that all accept web requests and all feed into the same channel queue or a sharded channel queue. It doesn't really matter. Each level of these can be scaled out horizontally. Now, workers themselves don't actually need to be put on the web server, but you can put them there if you want. <coughs> So for s small sites, so for example, a blog or a small website of some kind, the channel layer only needs to be an inter-process communication bus. So for example, um, you can use like shared memory. So it doesn't go over the network. All it is is just shared memory between the workers and the interface server. So quite simple, and it doesn't really change much if you're just using like the regular run server. That's what doing run server under channels will get you here. And Twisted understands WebSockets, so can channels too. Yep, WebSockets, Django, natively, yay. <laughs> but let's look into how it works specifically. So the channel, again, is where requests are put to be serviced. Now, what is a request? Now, a request can be an incoming HTTP request. So, for example, a user wants to get a page. It can be a connected WebSocket connection. So, someone has made a WebSocket connection to your server and wants to, you know, send some data or receive some data. There is also data on a WebSocket because WebSockets are two-way. So, a client can send the server some data. So, you want to be notified when the data comes and do something about it. So a channel, uh, sorry, <coughs> channels is made up of many channels, essentially. So channels are a string, uh, a string name. So here's some examples here. So http.request, http.disconnect, websocket.connect, websocket.receive, websocket.disconnect. These are all channels. <coughs> so what happens here? is a worker listens on these channel names. Now, essentially, the workers are just an infinite loop that's saying, hey, when an uh, event shows up, that is one of these ones I care about, so for example, I want to process HTTP requests, uh, just send it to me. So, uh, this is not working. Um, so what will happen is the worker will then go, oh, hey, there's a HTTP dot request, picks it up off the queue, and starts processing it. So these are in the form of messages. Now, messages contain information about the request. So all the things you'd want to know about. So a body and the headers, and where to send the response. Now, because channels goes through that task queue, I'll just come back to here. So because everything goes through task queue, now you'll notice that the workers aren't actually directly connected to the interface server. And the interface server is actually the thing that's holding the HTTP request. So because there's no direct connection, how are you supposed to send data back through? Well, there's the reply channel. Now, the reply channel will look something like this. So HTTP.response is the channel. Now, the exclamation mark there uh, delimits it so that you can have a unique identifier for each um, client. So, for example, this is what it would look like. So that's so, uh, so the, 
lot of it, is so that the response gets to where it actually came from. Because you wouldn't send it just some response to some random request. That wouldn't work. So what you do is you actually say, oh, this incoming request has this identifier. To send data back down the pipe, send a request to this channel with this client identifier. So when you're handling a request, you actually do this by doing channel.send on the response channel. So the downside to that is that if you are sending to a channel, you can't actually get some sort of response because it's event-driven. <coughs> Things, <coughs> things aren't called synchronously. So you don't really get, oh, I called this, and now I get a response. You, since they don't use asynchronous I.O. by default, then you would block. And you really don't want to block in one of the workers too much. Because even though they're synchronous workers, you can still block. But you, if you end up blocking for a long time, you'll end up with the thread and uh, process situation again, where you will end up having blocked workers, because then you won't have any to service any new requests. Now, because it's channels, you write synchronous code, but it's small synchronous code. You don't do a lot of things in it. So here's an example of a thing that sends to a WebSocket channel. Now, this mentions a group. Now, what's a group? Well, a group is a pool of request-specific channels for efficiently sending one-to-many messages. So if you have something that's, for example, all WebSocket users that are connected and are looking at a certain page. Uh, so say this page is a news article. Now, say your news article updates, and you want to send, hey, this has been updated, refresh the page, or here's the additional information, then you can add them all to a group. And then you only have to send one message to the group, and it gets fanned out to all the listening web sockets. Now, workers can handle different requests. They can listen to specific channels, because you, know, you might want to have some workers that handle bigger sort of requests, <coughs> and then some that handle you know, the smaller sorts of requests. So here's an example of that. So server three here is a bit beefier, a bit more high performance than your other servers. Now, you want to reserve this server for, say, some big data applications or processing images or all that sort of things. Now, before you really couldn't do something like this, you could send it on the celery task queue or something like that. But then you've, but then everything that's like an additional thing, well, this sort of embodies it in the core of your application. You don't have to worry about adding things to scale because it's all sort of there. You just pick and choose how you want to run it. So, for example, you can start off with a task queue that's in memory. And you can scale to using a task queue that's on Redis really, really easily. You don't have to change any of your code. But in this situation, this means that you can rather effortlessly handle requests that might make other hardware not work um, just by changing how you route things and what workers listen to what. <coughs> um, so you can create and listen on arbitrary channels. So you can send some information on a custom channel that does some specific uh, sort of task. Channels does not constrict you there. You can make them effortlessly. They're pretty much no cost to create a channel, because all it is is a string on the task queue. And then it's really effortless, uh, effortless to listen on a specific uh, task sort of channel. So here's a, the example of that big data one. You just do channel big data dot process dot send, and then you send a dictionary, which is the data that you want to send to the consumer of that of that uh, channel message. So say this big data here, um, the result of it needs to be fed straight to the outgoing HTTP request. 
Now, how do we do that? Well, what we do is we pass the reply channel in. Now, because the reply channel is just a string, you can pass it in and serialize it, just like anything else. And then all you need to do is just call dot .send on that special reply channel, and then it will magically go to the outgoing HTTP response. So it all just kind of works. Now, channels is kind of a bridge to a more asynchronous future. Because channels doesn't care if you're synchronous or asynchronous, because everything goes through that main task queue. It doesn't even care if you're written in Django or even in Python. Channels is just the implementation of something called asynchronous server gateway interface. And it's entirely possible to write a ASCII server or ASCII client or ASCII whatever in anything you want. So for example, you can have one in Go, you can have one in Django, you can have one in Twisted, you can have one in whatever platform you want, whatever programming language you want, whatever operating system you want, because it all goes through that task queue. It's not directly calling code, it's calling code in a sort of indirect manner so that you don't have to worry about that being a problem. Now, channels is due to land in Django 1.11 or 2.0, um, whatever they're calling it, and you can try it out. So I do have a lot of time for questions because I find that a lot of people ask me rather involved questions, so that's why, you know, I'm going to leave a lot of time for that. So, questions? Okay, uh, yeah. I have I have a quick channel and one is worker. Yep. Um, how how the performance? Because it will add up some uh, latency to the original request. How how does it perform? So, from the benchmarks I've seen. Well, uh, there is a little bit of added latency because you're adding things onto the task queue. And because you're adding things onto the task queue and waiting for workers, then there can be an indeterminate amount of latency before a worker comes and picks it up. Now, there is a, it changes the latency to be slightly different. Now, previous to Django channels, if it couldn't serve a request, it would just hold it. While in this, it will accept the request and add it to the task queue to be processed. So even though there will be more latency in a situation where you're not being fully utilized, there you may be less latency, may be than, less if latency hitting, than if you um, were uh, filling up all your threads and all your workers. So I would say that would be very minimal, um, simply because Redis and the interface server are very high performance. So you don't really have to worry about doing much more than just serializing it to JSON and stuffing it down a web pipe. But um, yeah, it is, something, it is something that if you have low latency requirements, then this might not be the thing for you. But for most general purpose web stuff, it's going to be um, incredibly um, insignificant in, in the long-term scheme of things. Um, you also, because of those added, channel, uh, added layers though, you do have a bit more control over when you do hit those situations where you become completely inundated with requests. Because those workers just connect to the task queue, it means that you can respond to um, large amounts of web requests pretty quickly just by adding more workers. Uh, while before you'd have to have like a full Nginx set up and a full Django set up and um, then set up your HA proxy to connect to that, which can lead to some problems. Um, so I think even if it does have a small amount of latency, it makes it easier to handle when latency becomes a problem. If that makes sense. Hi. Oh, uh, hi. I, 
have uh, two questions, uh, maybe one question and a follow up with the previous one. Uh, the first one is that you briefly mentioned that the queue was uh, mainly operated in a first in first out manner. Is there any way to customize that in the protocol or something? Yeah, and uh, another one is the follow up with the previous one. So you mentioned in your previous answer that uh, you're using JSON to connect, uh, to communicate between channels, mm -hmm. right? So uh, are there plans to make the, make the, make the structure more compact, like uh, using BSON or, or coming up with another like uh, format? Um, so I do know that Andrew has been looking into it. Uh, the reason why JSON was selected at first was because it works on everything and it's relatively easy to do in Python just because you import JSON. Um, so the biggest issue is that when you've got this sort of system that most of the time in the serialization isn't going to be putting it down the pipe or um, storing it, it's going to be turning your dictionary into JSON. Now, uh, JSON on PyPy, so the uh, just-in-time compiler for Python, is about 10 times faster than, for example, BSON or message pack, simply because it's so highly optimized and just-in-time interpreter kicks in. So in that case, it's not so much of a big deal between BSON and JSON. And when you've got a large amount of, uh, for example, um, body content or content you're sending, then the difference between JSON and BSON doesn't really uh, factor in as much because most of it is data that is packed in pretty much the same way and then it's just the, the actual uh, serialization overhead that comes the major thing. So <coughs> um, in, in short, for that one, um, because it's in its draft format, there hasn't been really much investigation into this. However, the spec, I believe, do is open to alternative serialization formats. And it really comes down to that if, if there is an edge case that you need to um, support some form of data like really compactly, then channels is rather easy to extend and make your own serialization format and your um, channel to be able to support that. So it shouldn't end up too much trouble if you want to support that yourself, if channels doesn't do it officially. But yeah. Um, and what was the first question again, sorry? Uh, about the task queue, does it uh, strictly perform in a, a first thing, first out manner, or do we have any, like, um, if there are some CPU intensive work, can we just put it uh, a, a bit lower in the queue? and? Um, so, the task, uh, the queue itself is first in, first out um, as a level of like the channel guarantee. However, that, that first in, first out is in the term of if you have two WebSocket connections, uh, sorry, two WebSocket received data, that the first data will be picked up off the queue after the second, uh, uh, sorry, before the second data. Now, that doesn't cover um, taking tasks off the queue. So, for example, you could have a worker that will process HTTP requests, and then if there's no available HTTP requests, it will try a more expensive one. So that's purely up to the worker itself, not the channel layer. Um, the channel layer just has to be first in, first out uh, to sort of get some data guarantees, because otherwise you might have uh, messages arrive out of order. Uh, but that's, that's purely on the same channel. You can process different channels differently, however you like, and there's, there's no problem with doing that. Uh, I'm just wondering what kind of ingredients that you use to build the channels, because I find that it will be easier for you to use something like RabbitMQ or Radish. So would you solve my doubts on this? Mm -hmm. So the channel queue is actually based on Redis uh, by default, but uh, the channel queue can be whatever message queue you want, basically. Redis is just the uh, first one simply because it's easy and everyone uses it a lot, but as long as it has the first in, first out guarantees, it doesn't really matter. You can use whatever you want. Oh, yeah. How about if you compare to the native queue on Python itself? Um, 
the native Q1 Python itself is in memory, so it's not across the network. So, you know, it, that would work pretty well for the in memory sort of uh, channels where, you know, your inter process communication is just the same process. So, for what you get now, if you, <coughs> sorry, uh, just ran run server. Um, so, yeah, it's because Redis and all of that is over the network, because you have workers on multiple servers, so you can't really use in memory queues at that point. But you can use any queue you want as long as it is first in, first out, and has a couple other guarantees. So if you're running it on the same machine, then you can use some sort of in-memory queue, for example, Python's queue. Um, you can have it running in threads that use on Python's queue. It doesn't really matter on, on the whole. You can use it however you want, just as long as it has those guarantees. Uh, uh, I have a uh, question about the, uh, the implementation of a task queue. Uh, task queue, queue can be another new SPOL, single point of player. Uh, uh, what do you have any recommend about the implementation of a task queue? I see uh, Django channel use uh, I think it's ladies, mm -hmm. but uh, ladies is not so useful for about scale, scaling out. Oh, so you're talking about yeah. how, how that scales, sorry? Yeah. Um, well, Redis scales pretty well. I don't use it myself. Um, but it does have pretty robust sharding. Um, and also, because you don't have to use Redis and you don't have to use um, the default queues, you can just write a queue yourself. Like You can bring your own queue just as long as it has those guarantees. So if there's a particular scaling, um, if one scales in a particular way that's better, then you can just use that, and that's no problem. Um, so, But Redis just scales out to multiple servers and thousands, thousands of concurrent requests a second rather easily, so I don't think it'll be too big of a, uh, of a deal, but I guess we'll see once people start getting on it. So. Um, I think my question might be a little bit rough, and I'm a, I'm a little bit confused about the, the group and channel. So uh, what can, can you give us more details about how the uh, the basic mechanism of how they interact with each other and how they work. Thank you. Okay, so a channel is one to one. So you have a, um, so for example, in the, let me just go back here. So here, so this is a one to one channel. So you send a message down that channel, and it is received by one consumer. So that's how a single channel works. Now, a group is just a bunch of these channels. So what you have is you have a group, and then you add this channel to it, and then it's pretty much exactly the same as keeping a list of these channels yourself and then calling .send on each of them. It's just a convenience that you only have one function call, and then it calls out to all of the groups automatically without having to maintain uh, all of the channels at the same time, without having to maintain a list of that yourself. Um, also, a group is persisted onto the task queue so that multiple workers can talk to the same group um, because a group has an identifier of its own, so it's sort of like a channel. But all essentially a group is is just a convenience function to hold a whole bunch of channels and then send the same message to one of them. So it's one message in, multiple messages out, because you might have, um, for example, 500 WebSocket connections. Each of them has their own thing that looks like this, but each has a different identifier. Um, and you add them all to the same group. You do group.send, and it goes out to all of those WebSocket connections, the same message, um, except it just makes it easier for you to do that without having to maintain a list of those channels and then uh, looping over them, essentially.
Anyone else? Nope. Cool. Well, I guess we're five minutes early for, for break then. Um, so that's all good. I would also like to mention, um, so I just got back from BahaiCon US, which was quite wonderful. Um, I did give a talk on there about Twisted and AsyncIO and how they sort of interact and how the feature goes. So if you're interested in learning about how the future of asynchronous programming itself is going to sort of happen in Python, I would recommend checking out that talk I gave. It's called the uh, Report of Our Death or the um, or the or Twisted and Tornado in the Async IO age. So if you're interested in that. Otherwise, if you're interested in Django channels itself, um, a, a good talk is Reinventing Django for the Real-Time Web by Andrew, um, who gave that on Py at PyCon US just a week ago. So that's a very good talk. He goes into more the technical details of it um, and gives a, a couple more examples. Um, there is also <sighs> HTTP2 APIs was given at PyCon US, which is also a good talk if you're interested in how HTTP2 might change things in the future because it uh, has things like server push and allows you to uh, have multiple concurrent um, requests in the same TCP channel, so a bit more higher performance for mobile um, devices and all that sort of thing. So some very good talks from last week's conference, um, some quite good talks from here from what I've seen. So yes. Lots of information if you if you wish to seek it. So thank you. Okay. So as usual, if you have any more questions, so you can. Yeah, uh, I will be around. And, uh, yeah, I'll be around. Happy to answer anything uh, you wish to ask me. So thank you.